everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. I want to welcome you to the January reading series presented by the Sundress Academy for the arts. people, now Eastern Band of the Cherokee Indians, Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, and United Kituwa Band of Cherokee Indians, and to Soya people, Yuki and Muskogee Creek. Thank you to the Tennessee Arts Commission for the grant which has made paying our readers tonight possible. And now please welcome our new Community Outreach Director, Sydney P., who's going to tell us about this month's community partner. Sydney? Thank you so much, Denise. Um, our community partner for January is the Knoxville Family Justice Center. The Knoxville Family Justice Center is a 501c3 organization that is the hub for domestic violence services in Knoxville and Knox County. At the Knoxville Family Justice Center, victims can access a range of services and support all in one place. Their mission is to end family violence through collaboration, education, and advocacy, and help survivors build a future of safety, opportunity, and choice. To learn more, visit uh, fjcknoxville.org, and to donate, you can visit fjcknoxville.org slash donate dot html. All right, uh, and I am also going to introduce Haley Griffith, the Coordinated Community Response and Outreach Director at the Knoxville Family Justice Center. Uh, her responsibilities include cultivating collaborative relationships among community organizations and partners, content development, and uh, raising community awareness about domestic violence. Haley was born and raised in East Tennessee and graduated from Carson Newman University in 2012, after which she lived and interned in Colorado for a few years before returning to her hometown where she now lives. Haley learned her, Haley earned her paralegal degree certification from the University University of Tennessee in Knoxville in 2017 and worked as the outreach coordinator for the Tennessee Senior Law Alliance at Legal Aid of East Tennessee prior to joining the Knoxville Family Justice Center team. Although she has been to all 50 states and enjoys traveling, she loves the East Tennessee and Great Smoky Mountain regions the most and spends her free time hiking and camping. Uh, Haley, if you would like to share any more information about the Knoxville Family Justice Center, we are so happy to have you with us here today. Hi, thank you, and thank you for that introduction. Um, like Sydney was saying, uh, I work at the Knoxville Family Justice Center. I've been there since May of last year, and um, I'm just going to give a brief overview of what the Family Justice Center is and what we do there. Um, so the first Family Justice Center in the nation um, opened in 2002 in San Diego. And the model was so successful in increasing prosecution of offenders and increasing victim safety and reducing homicides that the president actually at the time actually funded a family justice center initiative and um, allotted funding to the uh, opening of 15 other family justice centers across the nation. Um, one of the locations they looked at was Knox County because um, in 2002 and in 2003, when this was happening, um, Knox County already had a family justice coalition. So we didn't have a family justice center, um, but we already had a coalition of different community partners that were coordinating together to respond to DV um, domestic violence in Knox County. Um, so when we applied for the grant um, to start our own family justice center back in 2003, um, the fact that we already had that coalition was really attractive to them. Um, and so Knoxville was actually one of the original 15 locations that got funded for the opening of the Family Justice Center. Um, and what a Family Justice Center is, is it is just a collaborative partnership of different um, victim service providers in one county. So the way that I describe it to people is that the Family Justice Center is not its own entity as much as it's a partnership of different agencies. Um, so at our location, which is off of Harriet Tubman Street uh, near downtown, 
at our uh, physical location in that building, we have eight different on-site partners. Um, and those on-site partners are DCS is located at our center, as well as um, Knoxville Police Department Special Crimes Unit is located there. The Sheriff's Office's Family Crimes Unit is located there. Uh, the, D the District Attorney has an office there. Um, Legal Aid of East Tennessee's Domestic Violence Attorney uh, is located there. And then we also have advocates from different nonprofit service providers like McNabb Center and YWCA, um, both have advocates on site at the Family Justice Center. Um, and KCDC is there as well. So the idea is that prior to the founding of a Family Justice Center, victims have to go up to 20 different locations to get all of the services they need when they're trying to escape an abusive relationship. And that's difficult, especially when they're using public transportation and they may have children in tow and it's uh, just not the safest, quickest, easiest way to leave. And family justice centers co-locate all those different agencies under one roof so that victims only have to get go to one place and in two to three hours get the full range of services that they need. Um, so we provide services for domestic violence, child abuse, elder abuse, um, animal abuse as it relates to DV, um, sexual assault, stalking, and human trafficking. Um, and the different services that a victim can access through the Family Justice Center is they can meet with an advocate to get safety planning, to get help filing for an order of protection, to press charges if they want to and pursue criminal prosecution. Um, they can get access to emergency shelter, emergency pet shelter. They can get employment assistance. Um, there's a whole range of services and resources they can access through the Family Justice Center. Um, and the model is really special in the sense that when a victim comes in, they meet with an FJC staff person first, and that FJC staff person will explain to them about the model of a family justice center and all these different agencies that they that we partner with. And then the victim gets to decide which agency they want to work with and um, what services they want. So it really empowers them. They can work with law enforcement if they wanna work with law enforcement, but they don't have to. They can work with a nonprofit social services provider if they prefer to do that. Um, so it's really about empowering them and giving them their choice back um, during their help seeking process um, because studies have shown that that really facilitates their recovery and healing because a lack of choice is something that they um, have characteristically experienced in an abusive relationship. Um, at the Family Justice Center, we offer tangibles. So oftentimes when we have victims come in, um, they are leaving an extremely um, abusive situation because you do have those extreme cases and they leave with nothing. They don't have anything. Um, they have no resources. They don't have a phone. They don't have a car. Um, they don't have anything. Um, and so we provide um, those immediate needs um, we can provide a track phone for them. We can provide tangibles. Um, we give them grocery cards and gas, gas gift cards and um, whatever they need. We help them get into shelter if they need to get into shelter. Um, so that's kind of the whole range of services that we can provide. Um, we have eight on-site partners and we have over 50 agencies off-site that are in our partnership. So if there's something that an on-site partner can't help them with, we have this whole network um, of providers that are collaborating, collaborating together and in communication um, and really working together for a unified response to domestic violence in our community. So that's kind of a um, overview. And if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them if there's um, anything else that you wanna know. Well, if there's not Sorry. any questions, uh, you're fine. <laughs> if there's not any questions, um, Sydney dropped our donation link in the chat box. Um, donations are extremely helpful to us because when we were originally founded, we started as a quasi government agency, but we transitioned into becoming a nonprofit in 2017. Um, so we now solely exist based on um, grant 
funds and donations that we're able to fundraise. Um, and those donations go directly to helping victims, to providing those tangibles to them, to keeping the center open so that we can provide them with those um, coordinated services. Um, so we definitely appreciate your support and very thankful to have been invited uh, here today to share all of this with you guys. So thank you for having us. Thank you so much, Haley. And thank you for Sydney to bring, for bringing Haley forth for us. We appreciate that. Yes, thank okay. you. Okay, now for our reading. Um, our first reader today is Rasha Abdul Hadi. Rasha is a queer Palestinian Southerner who cut their teeth organizing on the south sides of Chicago and Atlanta. Rasha's writing has appeared in Strange Horizons, Shade Journal, Mizna, Room, Tap Magazine, Beltway Poetry, and Lambda Literary. Their work is anthologized in Essential Voices, a COVID-19 anthology forthcoming, Unfettered Hexes, Halal If You Hear Me, and Luminescent Threads, Connections to Octavia Butler. A fiber artist, poet, and speculative fiction writer and editor, Rasha is a member of Justice for Muslims Collective, the Radius of Arab American Writers, and Alternate Roots. Their new chapbook is Who is Old Springtime? I believe there's going to be a link dropped in the chat where you can find their work, along with a link where you can follow along with Rasha's poetry reading. I will turn it over to Rasha. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here with you all as someone who's been a resident at uh, Sundress Academy for the Arts. It's wonderful to return to be with you all, even virtually. My name is Rasha Abdul Hadi. I use they, them pronouns. I'm calling in from the traditional lands of the Anacostan, and the Nakachtank, the Piscataway peoples, close to the lands of the Powhatan, the Pamunkey, the Chickahominy, and other native nations both known and unknown. This city is also known as Chocolate City as a center of black culture and history. It is currently occupied as the capital of the settler colonial empire. For a visual description, I am a gender queer Palestinian with short curly hair that's shaved on the side. I'm wearing tortoise shell cat's eye glasses, maroon lipstick, and a black and rainbow kufiya over a blue and white floral pattern button down shirt. Behind me is a painting of the souk in Cairo and a sign that says for Gaza in the upper right. Uh, if you are interested in ordering a signed chapbook, you can order one from me directly. My cash app is capital R A capital H A D I. Um, and just let me know your email will work things out. Amid the fierceness of this pandemic portal passage, I want to offer tenderness in this reading to all who are in struggle tonight. The first piece I'm going to read is from Shade Journal from May of 2021. Um, it published as uh, Gaza was being carpet bombed. This is from Finished with the Peace for Palestine and Palestinians everywhere and for all of us who refuse to be quiet and well-behaved as federal, state, and local governments accelerate the mass death and disabling in this pandemic in service of profits and in abandonment of all supports to keep people alive. You can tell, can't you, Hayek Hava, how the peace is the war they won. Pursuing peace has been the best excuse for making war. That peace of quelling, peace of graveyard, peace of the heaven of the carpet bombed and altar bled, peace of the quiet they require, peace of the weight of chains, peace of the drowned. Peace of those by their own lives taken, peace of total surrender, the peace of everything stolen and nothing left to fight for or defend, peace of evicted homes, peace of full prisons, peace of 23 hours in solitary, peace of checkpoints, peace of total surveillance, the peace of no dissent or disagreement, peace of no payment for the workers, peace of empty farms, peace of full slaughterhouses, peace of blood on the slaughterhouse floor, peace of the empty clip and empty canister, peace of the tank's tread, peace of the drone's hum, peace of the hard-shelled fist of speed and progress of a more perfect union with the end of the baton, peace of the long road home from the locked city to the village, peace of the smooth surface of the long wall, peace of the sniper's perch, peace of disappearance, peace of kidnapping, peace of trust and gagged and no more the din of petition and protest, no more 
our jokes played, our banners planted on the back of police vans, our murals covering barricades, no more our dances against an audience of riot shields, no noise of the living, noise of the resisting, noise of children chasing each other, no noise of old folks talking story, no noise of groceries delivered, medicines delivered, dinners delivered, of debts loudly canceled and forgiven. No noise from the painters and poets and musicians, the puppet makers and sculptors. No more our mics electrified and feasts spread. No more the insurgent sound of us tending each other, making repair, reclaiming houses, derailing train engines to run as generators. So. <sighs> That piece is only published online, but you can read it there at Shade Journal. The next two pieces I wanna read are a diptych. They fit together and they actually uh, fit in a cycle. They're meant to be read in a loop. Um, they are both in the chapbook Who is Owed Springtime and were written in the springtime and summer of the first pandemic year, 2020. Uh, both are written after and for a dear friend and colleague. This is After the Ash Sermon by Vatra Chandra Sekara. Um, the first poem is Mouthful of Lightning. The second one is Mouthful of Ash. Uh, and you can read Vatra's poem in Kuali Journal. When they sing us out of this, I'm gonna start by reading the last section of the second poem, and then I'll finish with that section as well so you feel the loop. When they sing us out of this world, may the ash of our passing mix with their spit to make an ink. May their mouths be full of lightning when they call our names. So strip to the skin stretched over life debts and let rage flame to lightning in your mouth. Cleave the trunk of your reserve, this twisted tree to reveal the loamy heart composting itself inside so fertile and alive that even its interment will nourish. This brown body, once house of green monk parakeets, beaks now ready to sever a falcon leg. How many a former pet once sang in the branches overhead, how many now free will occupy the city locks. Mark this, we won't go back, we'll burn first. Burn in dive bar bathrooms against markered walls. Burn in streets, in cars, on wide grand steps. We'll make mess. On lawns and laneways, in the on and off ramps. We'll count our numbers among the numbers counted over all. Make pyre on beds, couches, floors, counters, every surface an altar for the ash of every desire. If we survive, we won't save each other, no. It will be burial one way or the other. We won't be able to help ourselves, drawn up wells and over oceans, across mountains and through fields, our knees so rough with kneeling, our palms velvet against the claw, fingerprints lost to the candles courting. We'll burn, we'll burn, we'll burn to the root of the earth. Perhaps the residue we leave behind is the ash of our burning in the mouths of those who knew us briefly and our best, most broken, and saw more than the roles we were playing at, bare on the threshold, caught in the storm strike, always entering the stream in the current of song. When they sing us out of this world, may the ash of our passing mix with their spit to make an ink, may their mouths be full of lightning when they call our names. I'm gonna read y'all a pandemic poem, another one. This is also in uh, Who is Owed Springtime. I wrote this early in the pandemic in a workshop led by Danielle Reed uh, when I was working with an arts organization and feeling like I had to become an expert as an organizer in uh, pandemic response protocols. This was first published in the Trans and Queer Special of MISNA in 2020. And uh, this is the first time I've read this since I got a long COVID diagnosis, but I'm 22 months in to uh, pretty intense long COVID fatigue. So care to everyone who is recovering from recent or not so recent fights with COVID. This is table of contents for a manual of pandemic response protocols and it's formatted as a table of contents. 
how to write a pandemic response protocol, how to lead in a time of global crisis, how to find your purpose in a hurricane, what to do when your depression meets the Great Depression, how to turn your complex PTSD into a leadership development program, how to be compassionate in the face of mortal terror, how to explain to everyone you know that things are very bad, how to explain to everyone you know that things are even worse, how to explain to everyone you know that things are much worse than we can imagine, how to imagine beyond your imagination, how to imagine total catastrophe and stay loving, how to make decisions in a time of complete uncertainty, how to stop worrying and learn to love the crisis, how to stop, how to find that your fury has no bottom, how to say everything you notice and feel, how to stop swallowing your insights, how to find your pandemic joy, credit to Darakshan Raja, how to keep yourself and others alive in America, credit Kiesa Lemon, how to keep yourself and others alive in Palestine, how others keep you alive, how to turn desolation into liberation, how to take escalation as opportunity, how to renew your rebellion, how to be careful, very careful, more careful than you've ever been, how to feel the domino of your somatic body, how to suspend the risk of your first and last true life. I think I might have time for both of these last poems because they're shorter. This uh, other poem is also written in a workshop with a fellow poet, um, poet Danielle Badra, uh, led a workshop. And this was written in 2017, not too long after the, that current regime had taken office. And I think a lot of folks were going to ground. And this is the time when a lot of folks are still thinking about that. This is called Quailing. And it's the second to last poem. Wrap now the last rose of faith and bury that flower to ferment. For you, now wrapped in dread, know the soft quail alone eludes the wagon, slips the wheel, and threads the hollow embrace of the brush. Be there, disappear, disappear, be safe, be small, be hidden to all but those who love you, be conjured only by necessity, by needful nearby summons scrawled in the letters of your name, so strangeness where you pass, leave feather down, cleave earth with cutlass claw, so small this tiller, just for a season or for a generation, go to ground, survive and multiply, keep your succulent skin to yourself, to yourself. I'll close with a poem from my first micro chat book, uh, Shell Houses. Uh, which is out of print. I have a few copies of folks who are super interested. I'm glad to send you one. Uh, when I was growing up in a small town, a high school guidance counselor once, once told me that the world was my oyster after a session in which she had offered me no help at all. And it seemed like a really funny thing to say. So this is your oysters. They say the world is your oyster and what they mean is the world is your pearl to find, but really the world is just oysters. And you're here shucking in foul smelling Wellingtons and a shrug of the shoulders that says, I hope you like shellfish, while trying to remember how lucky you are to put the question to so many oysters with the knife edge of your lifetime. If the world were your oyster, you'd wish for no pearls, seldom pearls, never pearls, because pearls are signs of the problem, aren't they? The heart sharp abrasion against the flesh wriggling in hard shell to feel less, to feel only beauty, to layer a pearl against pain. Give me instead the salty morsel, twisting muscle in its armor, a spasm of hunger open to the current, a hinged house that anchors the shoreline to itself. Thank you all for coming tonight. I'm excited to hear everyone else read. Thank you so much, Rasha. That was absolutely wonderful. I'm enthralled over here. <laughs> uh, okay, it's a little bit of a tough act to follow here for our next reader, but we'll see. We have Uwajaku Damien Akpara, a Nigerian writer and poet and the author of the poetry chat book, I Know the Origin of My Tremor, Sundress Publication 2021. 
He is an alumnus of the Spring Fellowship and Purple Hibiscus Trust Creative Writing Workshop taught by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. His works appear or are forthcoming in Poetry Magazine, African Writer Magazine, The Master's Review, 14 Poems, Ruminate, The Pen Review, 2035 Africa, and elsewhere. You can find his work at the link being dropped in the chat, along with a document that allows you to follow along with his reading. I give you Uwajaku. Thank you, Denise, for the introduction. It feels so good to be here. And thank you everyone for making time to be here. And to those who get to watch this by the YouTube channel, it's such a pleasure. So I'll be reading some of my poems published in my chapbook. I know the origin of my chairman by the wonderful people at Sundress Publications. I would also get to read some poems I've been on lately. And so to begin, so the first poem is titled Notes on Desire. And this poem chronics the struggles of being queer and effeminate in a hostile environment and I often say this, that a lot of living outside the spectrum of what the society knows as normal, especially as a queer person is filled with desire. So there might be this desire to fit in, to find a safe space, to truly live. And so you could just take the poem as a poetic on queer desire. So here's the poem. Notes on desire. I gulp this sadness like thirst. I want to be cuddled in it. I want to empty myself in it. Mother said, the first thing she notices about me is my quiet face underneath which lies the tremor. So subtle, you dream my hands into a nightingale. This absence, this longing, so humble, I strew them like sunlight into my prayers. Father wraps himself up as a gift says there's no greater education than this. I am never enough. I live in the shadows, somewhere between desire and envy. I do not wish to hurt a thing. At school, I am constantly looking for my image. I see a boy with coated nose and Vaseline as deep blows. We sit at the love garden to share our wounds. Does it hurt where you come from? Please, promise me this will end. The sound of desire is so loud, it burns like coal. Last night, I let a boy walk into my throat. I want to please him. I want him to hold me and call me pretty, my little emptiness. I want to see the reason to live in his eyes. Yesterday, he said, I dreamt of you which means I miss, I've missed you. When are we seeing again? This longing that out to me makes me feel more alive. Clean history is a sham. Every day I am running to find a boy who looks like me. Let's build a home where we dream our soft bodies into full beings. My parents have two children, both boys. More than wanted a girl, one she could trade clothes, clothes with. My cosmate says, God has a sense of humor. I don't agree. He morphs one into a beautiful, helpless flower that is made ugly by plucking. He finds his humor in the hands plucking it. So, so the next poem is titled, If I Die, What Would My Family Write as My Biography? So this poem is published in my chapbook and it explores Tremor as either anxiety or fear, as, or fear or fear as um, that comes with living as a queer person in a hostile environment. And I think now of a line from Romeo Rubin's poem titled Pink Club, where he writes, the bad things of freedom and we keep breaking it. And this poem sort of looks into that because even in a safe space, you still feel this sort of unease. And again, I was also thinking about the visual that comes um, that comes with um, queerness, especially in hostile families, whereby they would rather pretend that your queerness does not exist than stomach the fact that you are queer. Hence the title, if I die, what my family write as my biography. So here's the problem. One, 
I am not buoyant enough to hold joy spinning from a lover's mouth. Also, I eulogize my fears a lot, and sometimes I am everything at the age of my fingers. My lover holds my hands and whispers stick into the labyrinth of my right ear to calm the tremor dancing on my hands. But still, this revival crumbles at the foot of my demons. Two, so, sometimes the frenulum underneath my tongue shrinks and fear grips my larynx until it shuts like a banged door. I want to say, see, this is very hot, but I say see and back and break down into tears as though I love to bask in consolation. Three, outside my window, the wind blows dust and sand into my window pane. And here, I am also a synonym for paralysis. I lie in bed all day, pulling my fears away. But last night, an effeminate boy was bullied. The mob turned the street into a one way for him and filled their bellies with laughter. I sometimes imagine me as him. God knows I would bear myself open until death finds me. Oh. I die, what would my family write as my biography? Aside from educated, maybe. So calm and gentle, cute and quiet in lots, he held his anger tight, even when his face turned red, he still wouldn't let go. Five, point to a wound and watch me stutter. Sometimes amnesia got nothing on me. I once forgot a razor stuck on my thigh. I once forgot myself in a chapel, found myself hours later, kneeling with hands rested on the pew, wondering what I was doing there. Six, if my fear succeeds, and maybe you find me in a pool or in the hands of men burning with rage and bliss, please set me on fire and gather my ashes between the pages of my favorite book. And in my next word, I promise I'll come as a happy poem. So the next poem is titled Portrait of a Boy in Gorgeous Display. So while writing this poem, I was thinking about um, familiar relationships and um, the shift in power structure that often comes with um, independence when you're queer. And there is this coming out conversations where a lot of people talk about um, not coming out until you are independent, and which I think is fair because we've seen cases where things go really bad. And with independence, I feel it puts a lot of things into check, like um, the bullying is out, the disowning to an extent is out, um, being beaten is also out and being stripped of all benefits, of course, to an extent. So here's the poem, Portrait of a Boy in Gorgeous Display. And in his garden, we sit side by side reading. It is the best thing we know how to do. The pulling and flinging of things we find on Saturn, like a boy who isn't the boy he knows. In the beginning, the dream was childlike and filled with hope. It was easier to name, to say soft and shy, like his mother. But we've moved past this thing, where hope is an egret we flutter our hands to, and he no longer searches for its end. He watches me lift a weed in all my gorgeous display, and within he bleeds again, the quiet between us filled with brokenness. In the years before this, I would slap my hand, the gorgeous display of a farm boy, and shriek at the loss of a son. But we, but we sit side by side and we do not speak. So this next poem, in which I sit with my father on a threshold, also explores um, the same shift in power structure. So here, the, the narrator who happens to be queer sits with the father, it doesn't like, I know a threshold is, a threshold stays on, is the platform on the door. So um, the, the narrator doesn't cross over, or doesn't leave house to go seek for home in another place. He stays with his father, irrespective of how uncomfortable it is for, the, for both of them. So here's the poem in which I sit with my father on a threshold. I am retracing language as I come undone in my father's arms. I watch his hands fall apart, 
like a bird's wings, and we haven't killed anything yet, save the softness buried within my throat. The road to exile is nothing but a dim road, and you in a car with your hope clinging to the walls, waiting for the lights the music has. I sit with him and learn how to twat the silence in. I am tired of running, of falling into every man's hand in search of a voice to call me king. I desire nothing but for the city to see me in my lush nakedness and love me. Here, the door opens and I sit and marry out of his hinges. So this poem, Exile leaves you at the foot of desire. It begins with an epigraph by Romeo Urogu. We who are endangered, we keep searching for a place to call home. And while writing this poem, I was thinking about how um, queer persons in hostile environments from hostile families always look towards existing or moving away from, from there and with the, with the hope that it brings peace for them. And I was thinking about how, how it's not entirely true because when, when you get to leave the environment, there's still this yearning to come home or to have this familiar bond and familiar relationship with your family. And but irrespective of that, the narrator still stays wherever he is instead of going back to a place that doesn't hold the promise of seeing him and accepting him um, as he is. So exile leaves you at the fruits of desire. Here, loneliness coars in your bones and shudders your body into a broken allergy. Exile leaves you at the fruits of desire, begging to know joy again. But desire sometimes makes no room for the penetration of joy. Here at night, your father's ghost hovers over you, digs its fingers into the core of your dreams to harvest the reflection of joy. Your mother calls and calls and calls and you do not answer. She calls and calls and calls until tremors frolic her fingers and she calls you into her losses again. The first time was when you could not contain your hunger in the cinema and you kissed the boy and felt it was right. You did it again, this time with hugs and tears and although it was dark, still lynching found you and left the both of you at the misses of life. Your mother's call comes again, and your ringing tone becomes the voice of home coming behind you to come witness joy. But it's all a facade. It's all a facade. It's all a facade. You whisper to yourself to join the voice. Um, so this poem, Survivor, also chronics um, the next poem, Survivor. It also chronics the struggles of being queer or being queer in the hostile environment. And it highlights the inaccessibility to proper health care or even to reporting cases of blackmail because these resources are stripped out, are stripped off from, from you because you because the the environment does not provide channels to address to address it as a queer person. So here's here it is, survival. In the club, you danced like fire, spewed your grief like gene, why I in a room knotted my body into all rigid things to be cloud my thirst for men. Fear knows how best to sit in a room, knows how to shrink until it ripples into your body. You danced and flickered like candlelight, tried so hard not to lean into a boy's arms and mourn all the things eating queer boys up. You tried hard because you could be another Chijoke whose bones now serve as maps to dead queer boys, whose last prayers were ashes falling on burning tongues. Or another Ifejus or gulped whole by disease, whose bones outlived his flesh on his dying bed, devoid of the smell of antiseptics. How could he tell where drowning began? Or me, who misread a blackmailer's lips for a lover's? See, I am shrinking while my nudes spread like fox on my Facebook timeline. You did not cuddle my sadness with me. Instead, you left to live in a club because each time we see the morning sun sneak into our rooms like white flowers, we bless the universe for we now are a miracle, 
he survived lynch. But dear you were dancing like it was your last night. Still, I know you are learning to live. The way your eyes fail to gaze at the waste of boys twisting into a hunger you wanted to feel with your mouth. So I think I'll end here because of time. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ubojaku. Okay, our final reader for this evening is Michelle Ross. Michelle is the author of a story collection, There's So Much They Haven't Told You, winner of the 2016 Moon City Short Fiction Award, and Shape Shifting, winner of the 2020 Stillhouse Press Short Fiction Award. Her third story collection, They Kept Running, is winner of the 2021 Catherine Ann Porter Prize in Short Fiction and is forthcoming in April 2022. Her work is included in Best Microfiction 2020 and 2021, the Best Small Fictions 2021, and in the forthcoming Norton Anthology, Flash Fiction America. She is the fiction editor of the Atticus Review. You will find a link to her work in the chat, along with the document where we can follow along. Michelle, the floor is yours. Thank you so much to Sundress for having me, and thank you too to my fellow readers for their wonderful readings. I'm going to read um, the beginning and a an additional small excerpt from a short story in my most recent collection, Shapeshifting. And the story is called, A Mouth is a House for Teeth. The mother is never to answer the door. If there's a knock, she is to hide. She is to hide herself and the girl and make it appear that no one is home. Unless the knock is the husband's secret knock that only the two of them know. Then she is to open the door. There's a keyhole, of course, but the husband doesn't take the key with him when he's away. For starters, carrying a key is a nuisance. Second, why does he need a key if she is always home? Third, and most important, what if someone who wishes to hurt the girl and the mother steals the key from the husband and lets himself into the house? The outside is dangerous to the girl and by proxy dangerous to the mother. In truth, the outside would be dangerous to the mother even if she were not a mother, but because there is the child, the mother is particularly vulnerable. The only time she should ever open the door other than when she hears the secret knock that only she and the husband know is when there is a supply drop. She knows supplies have arrived because she hears the supply box thunk the concrete. She knows the thunk is the supply box because she schedules the delivery of the supply boxes and always the boxes show up at the exact second they are scheduled. Now, for instance, she hears the scheduled thunk. She looks through the peephole and sees the box. The dimensions distorted by the peephole's fisheye lens. She opens the door. There before her is the box. There before her is also a decapitated head of a rabbit, a few inches from the box. It's shriveled, old. Through the peephole, she assumed it was a rock that had gotten kicked up by wind. Actually, perhaps the truth is, she didn't think anything of it at all. Now, the dead rabbit's dull black eyes seem to stare at her feet. She looks around, but she sees no one, not even the drone that delivered the box, not even her closest neighbor, who is not a mother of a young child and who therefore is free to go outside as she pleases. What the mother does see is the street, the street that goes for miles and miles and that connects to other streets that go for miles and miles all of which connect to the interstate system, like a capillary in a network of blood vessels that circuit the country. Follow it and you can go anywhere. She feels the pull of the street, or maybe this pull is just hormones. She knows better than to trust hormones. Hormones are how she got here in the first place. She drags the supply box into the house and quickly closes and locks the door. She looks through the peephole at the rabbit head that looks like a stone. 
the mother doesn't hear the girl approach. The girl says, daddy home? And the mother screams. When the girl cries, the mother hugs her, sorry. I didn't know you were there. It's just the supply box. See, when is daddy coming home? The girl asks. Like I told you, baby, I don't know. When's he gonna call? I don't know. Let's see about breakfast, okay? The girl returns to her bedroom, shuts the door. The mother looks out the peephole again. The rabbit head is gone. She puts her hand on the knob, thinks of opening the door to be sure the rabbit head wasn't just blown closer to the door with a fisheye can't reach. But to open the door again, when she has already dragged in the supply box, would be breaking protocol. As long as they follow protocol, they are safe. The girl is safe. The mother is safe. The husband has told her this hundreds of times. She takes her hand off the door. When the husband is away, there is no certainty of when he will return. There is no certainty he will return at all. This is basic common sense and would be so even if the husband's work wasn't dangerous which it is, it would be common sense even if he could talk openly to the mother and the girl about his work, which he cannot. Sometimes when the husband has had a drink and is feeling good, he might say like they do in the movies, I'd tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. Then he laughs or he doesn't. It's been five days now since the husband last called. This is not unusual. When he doesn't call for several days, sometimes the mother imagines the husband is dead. She wonders how much time will pass before someone informs her. Sometimes when he does call, like he does today, when she and the girl are eating blueberry pancakes and says, it's been a really tough week, and man, am I exhausted, and doesn't ask how she's doing, she wishes he were dead. When the girl was born, the husband was always finding excuses to leave the house. They needed more diapers. They needed more crackers. The car needed a full detail and wax. She says, before you go, I need to tell you something. There was a rabbit head next to the supply box this morning. A what? A decapitated rabbit head, she says. The girl pays close attention. The mother continues, and then barely a minute later, when I looked out the peephole, the rabbit head was gone. Probably a hawk or a cat, the husband says, that decapitated, decapitated it or that hauled it away as soon as I dragged in the supply box. Both, he says. I'm sure it's nothing to worry about. You're following protocol? She says, of course. Then you have nothing to worry about, he says. The head was shriveled, old, she says. Probably the wind lifted it as easily as a pebble. The husband asked the girl how she's doing. The girl says, I had to get an antibiotic. I had an infection in my leg. The husband, who seconds earlier seemed disinterested in them and in a rush to get off the phone to get dinner, now has a dozen questions. The girl tells him about how she had a cut and the mother left a bandage on her leg for three days, forgetting to change it or check it. And about how when the mother did pull the bandage off, finally, beneath were two large mounds full of pus. Then the next day, there were several more pustules in the girl's leg, hence the antibiotic delivered in a supply box. The husband says, did you not bathe her for three whole days? The mother says, I forgot. And it's not like she gets dirty never leaving the house. I'm just trying to survive. It's not easy doing everything myself. He says, well, I hope our daughter survives too. The mother says nothing. After they say their goodbyes and hang up the phone, the girl says, I wish I had gotten to see the rabbit head. I wish you had called me. That would be breaking protocol now, wouldn't it? The mother says. 
I never get to see anything, the girl says. Of course, the mother longs for the girl to grow up differently. She longs for the girl to be safe in the outside world, to roam free the way she once had. So long ago now, it seems like a dream, but absolutely she must ensure that the girl follows protocol. Absolutely, she must keep the girl safe. As the girl steps out of the bath and the mother presses a towel to the girl's wet hair, the girl says, I want to cut you open and wear your skin like a house. The mother plays a game with the girl sometimes, a game she learned from her own mother in which they use a house as a metaphor for everything and anything that contains, as in a sock is a house for a foot, a lock is a house for a key, a mouth is a house for teeth. The girl leans into the mother the way she always does after a bath, wraps her wet limbs around the mother. She is so small, so easy to break, and the outside is full of men who wish to break her. Is it any wonder the girl should want to hide in her mother's skin? The mother worries about the girl's fear. The girl has never played with another child. She has never seen another child except on television or in books. The girl will not know how to be with other people. She will be afraid, suspicious, awkward. The mother often watches the neighbor pruning her roses or backing out of the driveway in a car, sunglasses concealing her eyes. The mother once did these things before she got pregnant. She could have chosen to remain unpregnant, unmothered, free. She was never comfortable in the world though. She wonders if this has much to do with the way she, or with why she became pregnant. Maybe it was less hormones, more fear. What she couldn't have known was that there is plenty to fear in here too. All mothers must fear at some point that their children may hurt them. That's putting it too mildly. All children do hurt their mothers. They tear their way out of their mother's bodies after all, unless a doctor cuts into the mother instead of the child's head and shoulders. And then there is the biting of her nipples, the exhaustion when the child cries in the middle of the night, the first time the child hits the mother, the first time the child says to the mother that she hates her or that the mother is stupid or ugly or unlovable. Such injuries are accepted as normal. Children separating their identities from that of the mother, psychologists say, may be cruel. It's a necessary violence. The mother, being a woman, has come to expect a certain level of cruelty and violence. Like outside, when men on the street have yelled at her before she got pregnant and left the outside, that she looked like she needed to be fucked, or that it, when a man on the street grabbed her ass, or when a man in the office she used to work in would talk over her again and again in meetings, or when the husband, before he became the husband, told her once that no one else would ever love her like he loves her, a declaration he seemed to think would make her feel loved. But what she heard was that she ought to feel lucky he bothers with her because nobody else would. I'm stopping there, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Michelle. I don't know if you're paying attention to the chat, but we've got some people that are falling in love with those wonderful words you just shared with us. Um, okay, now we're going to uh, open up for our Q&A portion of tonight's reading. So if you have any questions to ask our lovely readers, this is the time. Taking a glance at the chat just to make sure I'm not missing anything. I don't see anyone unmuting. I'm going to assume that that means you are all completely blown away by the work that we just heard. I know that I am. Um, and so you need time to digest. I get that. We've given you the contact information for our readers. So when you think of that question later on, you can always reach out to them. Okay. All right, I want to remind you all, please 
not to forget to donate to our January community partner, the Knoxville Family Justice Center. The link at which you can make that donation has been dropped in the chat for you once again. Um, on Wednesday, February 9th from 6 to 7.30 p.m., please be sure to join us for our February workshop. The Confluence of Rhythms Begins, Mapping the Sounds of Your Poems, hosted by Sandra Marchetti. Bring a couple of drafts in progress at any stage to revise for that workshop. We also hope to see you at next month's CrossFit, hosted by SAFTA, residence, SAFTA Writer in Residence, Joanna Brooker, on February 20th from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And lastly, we would love to see you at our February reading series on February 23rd from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, featuring Quentin Collins, Rebecca Pelkey, and Heike Hutari. Be on the lookout for more information on these events forthcoming on our Facebook page. Thank you everyone for being with us tonight. Have a wonderful evening.